essentially you've got about 10, 12 days before you've got the most important court case of your life, of your life. So tonight's going to get you in the headspace for it, going to start getting you in there inspired and you're on a ready to illuminate its light. That's, that's the goal. So Chai Elo, the 18th of Elo is tonight. It's a very important night in, in, in Kabbalah. It's the, it's the birthday of the Baal Shem Tov. I definitely recommend that maybe before you go to sleep tonight, you maybe say to Hillim and then marry to the Baal Shem Tov and then you make a prayer and you ask him to be an advocate for you. And one of the key principles in Hasidus, which he taught, which the Balatanya taught, is the following. Have you ever heard of the phrase, the king is in the field? In fact, one of my um, friends wrote a song about it. So you can check out this quite a cool, like, Kabbalistic song about the king in the field. But it's a deep idea. What does it mean the king is in the field? It means that normally throughout the year, the king is in the palace. He's in the, the chamber. And in fact, on Shabbos, the king invites us to come and spend... Shabbos with him to come in, into the palace. But the reason why we're here in this world is to utilize our free will and to deal with the physical darkness of the material of the world and to elevate it. And for that, we have to be in the field. But in Elul, the king comes out of the palace and comes with us in the field. And we're, it's way more accessible. It's more accessible to connect to Hashem during Elul. It's more accessible to do to Shuvah in Elul than it is throughout the year because Hashem's closer, whatever that means. It, it's easier to do to Shuvah. There's more siyat to Dishmaya. There's more divine providence. The king's in the field. And by the king in the field, really, our thoughts and actions should change a little bit during the month of Elul. In the old days, they used to literally in the yeshiva world just say Elul. And people used to... <gasps> Oh my gosh, Rosh Hashanah coming, Yom Kippur coming. Like hundreds of years ago, my Rebbe, that rabbi over there called Reb Revde, he told me that the, his Rebbe called the Rebbe Cheskel Levinstein, the Mashkiach of Mir, the famous Mashkiach of Mir, one year when he found the yeshiva wasn't really connecting it at all, he came in with his kittel, with his like white coat that you wear on Rosh Hashanah. And that got everyone in the mood straight away. So Elul, which stands for as well, Ani ledoidi vedoidi li, I am my beloved, and my beloved is for me. Hashem is super close right now. I hope you've had moments of inspiration during Elul, especially between now and Rosh Hashanah. This is the time, my friends. This is the time for change. If not now, when? And hopefully what we're going to learn about tonight will be, please got a catalyst for that change. In fact, one of the actions we're meant to be doing throughout the month of Elul, if you haven't done it already, you should start doing it, which is to be saying to Hillim, to say the Tehillim, Dafka number 27. Ledovit Hashem Ori V'yishi. King David writes, Hashem is my light, which is Rosh Hashanah, V'yishi, which is my salvation, which is Yom Kippur. And then it says, Kitz B'neni B'sukoi, then refers to Sukkot. So this is, throughout the whole of Tishri, we say Ledovit Hashem Ori, and I really recommend you say it. And by the way, if anyone's struggling to look for clarity, it's the most beautiful Tehillim about clarity. We ask Hashem, Hashem, guide me, which is what I think we're all looking for. A bit of clarity and guidance in life, and that's definitely a Tehillim for that. But let's just start off with a story to get us in the mood before we delve into what is Teshuvah, according to the Rambam. Let's start with a story, if I might, if I may. Sorry, I heard today. Thank you, my, my, my son-in-law, for, for sending it to me. From Rav Dovi Ben Shushan. And here comes, this is what the story is. Happened a few years ago in a place called Shore Hills, New Jersey. Anyone in New Jersey there tonight? If you're in New Jersey, send me a wave, everybody, if anyone's there in New Jersey tonight. Shore Hill, New Jersey. And, a, and Shore Hill, New Jersey wasn't like a big religious Jewish community at all. And this Chabad rabbi went to the community to try and like start it. And he literally went with his wife and had a couple of people, doesn't really work for a minion. Slowly, slowly started building the community. Super charismatic guy, very special guy. And there was a young Russian boy that started coming to a lot of the programs, got in super inspired, became Shoma Shabbat, Shoma Kashrut. And in Shore Hill, New Jersey, this Chabad rabbi made the first Shore Hill Shidduch. His Rebbetzin had been teaching a young girl from New Jersey, and it was the first Shore Hill Shidduch. And the first Shore Hill Shidduch, I can't even say it, it's a bit of a thing tongue twister, they got engaged, they got engaged, and a few months later, it was the first Shore Hill, New Jersey marriage. 
and the Chabad Rabbi was so excited. The Rabbi was like, oh my gosh, like we have to make this the happiest day ever. And, and specifically this Russian boy had been through a lot. He's changed his whole life again. He came from a family very, very secular from Russia. And he wanted to give him the time of his life. So the rabbi said, I am going to make it the happiest simcha ever. So they got after the chuppah, they got to the dinner. And the rabbi said, we're going to get every single person in this room dancing. Everyone's going to dance. It's not going to be one person I'm going to allow to sit on a chair. Which, by the way, you're lucky you weren't there, right? Because otherwise you'd have been literally chapped. Have you ever had that in a, in a wedding where you get chapped? And, and, and the rabbi was chapping everyone, chapping everyone. And there was, everyone was dancing apart from one old man in the corner. So the rabbi is like, no, no, he's not getting out of it. He might be old, but you're going to dance tonight. And he comes up to him and he says, listen, it's, I'm the rabbi here. So you've got to do whatever the rabbi says. So uh, the rabbi is saying, you've got to dance. And the old man sitting in the chair saying, no, no I, re I really can't. Like, like, I really can't. Like, I wish, but I can't. The rabbi says, no, no. You're young, you're really young at heart. Come on, you're coming with me. And the old man says, no, you really don't understand. I really, really can't. So the rabbi said, okay, what's going on? And he sat down and the old man said, your lovely groom, I'm his grandfather. I'm his grandfather. And, and first of all, I want to thank you for inspiring him, helping him get married, having one of the most happiest days of my life. But a few weeks ago, my grandson came to me with a very interesting request and said, thank you, and said, do you mind, do you mind under the chuppah? I want you to be under the chuppah. But when you're under the chuppah, the shechinah's under the chuppah, the divine presence under the chuppah. And you, my dear grandfather, you, my dear grandfather, you're uncircumcised. You're uncircumcised. Is there any way? Is there any way that you can please? I know it's a lot to ask. I know it's too much to ask. But is there any way, my dear grandfather, you can get circumcised for my wedding and have a Brit Mila and have a circumcision for my wedding? And the grandfather said to the rabbi, this morning I had a Brit Mila. As an 87-year-old man, a bit like Abraham, I had my circumcision this morning. So if, you, if it's okay with you, I'm feeling a little bit not there. There's no, I can't even move, right? There's no way I'm going to dance. Isn't that imagine? Can you imagine? Would you do that for your grandchildren? Go and have a bris milah for your grandson. So the rabbi was obviously by then super inspired, a little bit teary-eyed. And the rabbi said, I've got to give you something. I've been waiting for the right moment to give you something. And he took out of his pocket an envelope and in that envelope there was a dollar bill it was a dollar bill and he said let me tell you a story about this dollar bill in 1977 when I was a little boy around Crown Heights and I used to go to hear the Rebbe and at the end everyone was going past the Rebbe asking for a dollar bill so I went and tried to rush forward one day and the Rebbe looked at me and gave me the dollar bill and said, this is for Rafua Shalema. This is for Rafua Shalema. This is, you'll feel better. And the boy said, I was, I was fine. So he realized the Rebbe is giving him something. The one day he's going to meet someone that needs a Rafua Shalema, that needs a Rafua Shalema. And he said, I've been waiting for a few years. Who's that? And I feel right now in my heart and soul, you're the person. And the old man started crying. The old man started crying. And the Rebbe said, are you okay? Is it the bris? Like, what's going on? And the old man said, 20 years before that, when I came from Russia to America, we went to see the big Rebbe from Lubavitch. And I was taken. And I went for the dollar bill. And the Rebbe held my hands and said, you haven't been circumcised. You haven't been, I, I can't help you. You haven't been circumcised. And, and the man said, I, I come from a very secular family in Russia. What do you expect? So the Rebbe looked to him. He said, I'll give you one dollar bill now. And he said, I'll give you another dollar bill the day you get circumcised. <laughs> and 50 years later, he got his second dollar bill. The Rebbe had Ruach HaKodesh, but 
why I share this with you is because that man 50 years earlier had his chance. The Reb is there saying to him, Yala, go and get circumcised. I'll give you another dollar bill. He gave him the chance. He, gave he didn't step up to the plate, unfortunately. And why I share this with you, we're going to speak about Elo. And we're going to speak about Shuva. Let's not waste this inspiration. Inspiration is a gift. But it's so easy just to ignore it. And just, just uh, keep on with the status quo. You know, it's not, it's not the time now, Hashem. Like, you know, it's not very convenient. There's a, there's a pandemic right now. You know what I mean? Things are tough at work. You know, things are tough in relationships. Like, in a few years' time, it'll be a better time to start being kosher. It'll be a better time to start keeping Shabbat. It'll be a better time to start getting a bris. It'll be a better time to really change my life around. Uh, come back to me a few years later. Chaval. Because now the king's in the field. Elo, the king's in the field. He's with us right now. He's going to try and help you right now, but we've got to make that first step. It says in the Talmud, Hashem says, you open up for me the opening, the size of a needle, and then I will open up the opening, the size of a great hallway. But we have to make that first step. And if we make that first step, Hashem will help us tremendously. So let's learn tonight exactly what Teshuvah is, everybody. What is repentance? Why it means the word return. Shuvah means we translate it as repentance, but yet it also means the word return. And by the way, in modern Hebrew, a tshuva is an answer. What has it got to do with an answer? So let's try and understand why that is. So as I said tonight, we're on live. We've also got a few people around the table as well. One of them is Yeshua, and I wanted to say something for your mother. Her mother's name is? Leiloi Nishmat. Leiloi Nishmat. Um, Rachel Bat Eliyahu. Rachel Bat Eliyahu. Eliyahu Aaron. Aaron. Zaken. Zaken. It's Hashem Shabbat and Eliana Shama. She'll be a maid, it's Yosha. She'll be an advocate for all of us. Okay. Let's go. to Teshuvah. What is Teshuvah? What is Teshuvah? So let's learn a little bit from the Rambam himself. Anybody who's online and wants to go to Chabad.org and you put in the laws of Teshuvah, Maimonides, then you could look at it for yourself as well. Even those around the table, if you want to put it on your phone, right? Laws of Shiva, the Rambam. Or well, you can get my Rambam out there, Simon, if you want to read from it. I'll leave it in the public negotiation. There is one with English, actually. Eight, I'm going to open that one there. Um, yes. Is it daily or online? I don't know. Oh, okay. It could be. I can't see everyone. Okay, cool. <laughs> that one, that brown one there? Yeah. See, so pass that to Simon there. Let me finish my mind. Okay. Let's move to Laws of Shiva, chapter one. Here we go. And we're going to go, we're going to like learn some of the laws and then we'll go deep and Kabbalistic and philosophic and go super deep and blow our minds, everybody, in a good way. But let's start off with some core basics first. Says the Rambam, says Maimonides. What is Teshuvah? He's, so there are, and someone can type in, how many mitzvahs in the Torah are there, everybody? Six, six, one, three, six one, one, three. How many positive? Four, two, two, eight, two, four, eight. Two, four, eight, and negative. I'm not like with my mental maths. <laughs> By the way, it's the easy way to remember. The cutter, you should know this, right? You should definitely know this. Know this. And the way to remember is how many days of the, the, the year are there? Three, six, five. Three, six, five. That connects to the negative mitzvahs, which is really deep, I think, which means time and, and space is, is automatically going to try and gravitate you towards the material. We need to know that. And then the 248 mitzvah, which is... The numerical value of Abraham, Abraham is 248. Rechem, mercy is 248. Rechem, a womb is 248. Bones in the body. The bones in the body, very good, Dells, very good. We're going to speak about it. 248. Um, limbs in the body, Evarim, are, are 248. And the sinews and bones are 365, which is amazing. Basically, your whole body is a map of spirituality. So your right arm connects to mitzvahs and your left arm connects to mitzvahs and your nose and your eyes. It's amazing how the whole spiritual system connects to our anatomy. So this says the Rambam, you've got 613 mitzvahs. Each one of them, whether we make a mistake and don't do them or transgress them, even by accident, we have the chance to do shiva. We have the chance to say sorry. We have the chance to repent. We have the chance to return. Meaning, when we sin or we don't do a mitzvah. So, for example, if anybody's spoken Rosh Hashanah this year, you've got a chance between now and Rosh Hashanah to transgress, to 
Say sorry to atone for it. If anybody, any man hasn't put on tefillin this year, on any day, then we can do teshuva for it. And uh, 613 mitzvah, 613 opportunities to do teshuva for each. So there's, there's no one mitzvah apart from one where you can't do teshuva. Do you know the, actually you can do teshuva, just so you're not forgiven in this world. Anyone know what that is? What's kind of one of the worst ones? So the Rambam says at the end of the Lord's Tshuva, what's called Chilul Hashem. If you desecrate God's name publicly, someone like Bernie Madoff, where everyone knows he's Jewish, and he does such a public theft on his Ponzi scheme, and people then say, that's how the Jew behaves. And in fact, maybe he was a religious Jew. That's how really, look how the Jews behave. Not a lot you can do in this world for that. You've meant to do tshuva, but the Rambam says you've got to wait till the next world, and only then Hashem can forgive you. This world, we can't get forgiven because, and he sees the power. That we're here in this world to be makadi shem shemaim, to give glory to the king, to show that we, the Jewish people, are meant to be the ethical beacon, a moral beacon. We've got to be immense. We've got to be honest. We've got to have integrity. We've got to be straight. One of the words of the Jewish people is Yisrael. We've got Yisharun here, which is straight to the 15th spiritual level. Yisrael, straight to Hashem. We've got to be honest, straight, and te- people of integrity. And when we're not living that way, we, God forbid, go to what's called Chilal Hashem. So the Rambam says, anytime you make a mistake, we can do tshuva. And then the way he puts it, which is very controversial, and maybe we'll speak about it, we are obligated to confess. Meaning, in the Bible, it talks overtly about confession. You need to confess. And I believe that's why the other religion down the road does a lot about confession, way in, well into confession. Just us guys shouldn't be going to, behind a curtain to a bloke and saying sorry, right? What we need to do is is we need to talk to Hashem, right? Sorry if there's any blokes out there who are offended by that. Right, and I'm, I'm, very, in, I'm, very, into, I'm very into multi-faith, so it's all good, right? But, um, but, you know, the Torah actually doesn't say you're meant to go to a bloke behind a curtain. The Torah says you're meant to go to Hashem and talk to God. You have to talk to Hashem. So we do that and we'll speak about how we do that. And the Ramam says, Vido izu mitzvah Confession is one of the 613 mitzvot. But controversially, he does not say teshuva. Repentance is one of the 613 mitzvot. He somewhat separates between teshuva and, and confession, which we'll speak about soon. He says, how do you do confession? And he says, this is what you're meant to say. And we do this really on Yom Kippur. By the way, it's really important to note that Rosh Hashanah is not the time for confessing. You know that? Do you remember from last year I taught you? Every year I teach you, I'll teach you again, hopefully next week. Confession is not about Rosh Hashanah. We don't go like this on Rosh Hashanah. In fact, don't confess on Rosh Hashanah. It's not a good idea. Hashem sitting on the throne with justice. He don't say, oh, let's tell you what I did last night. Shut up. Don't say a word. No one wants to hear. Not now. Ten days later, we'll chat about that, right? Not on Rosh Hashanah. Let's not spoil the atmosphere, right? And, and there's a lot of din. It's not the time or the place. So... Yom Kippur, we're going to do a lot of vidoy, and the Rambam says what we do with confession, we say, Hashem, I've sinned, I transgressed, I committed iniquity before you, I regret and I'm embarrassed for my deeds, and I promise never to do it again. That's confession, we elucidate and verbalize exactly what it is, and one of the reasons we say it isn't because Hashem didn't know, he knew it before you were born, it's because, like you try and get a child to say to the parent, what did you do wrong? What did you do? Because it brings it out of them, it makes them come and admit it to themselves and inspires their to shove it from themselves. That's why someone does it. That's why, that's why someone does it. And then it says like this. And then the Rambam says like this. Very important. That's what we're getting at. Now, in the time of the temple, we used to do a lot of sacrifices. That used to help to atone. Nowadays, this is what you have to do. He says like this. To shove mechaperes al To shove Saying sorry, returning. We'll talk about why it means to return soon. Repairing, repenting, atones for all the Averas. Even someone who's wicked all the days of his life. And in the very end of his life, he says, sorry, Hashem. What have I done? What a Muppet I've been. I really messed up. Forgive me. And he genuinely does to Shiva. He's not 
mentioned in the next world that he's a Russia. On the contrary, he can receive the Shiva. And in fact, the power of Yom Kippur is so incredibly powerful that the essence of Yom Kippur itself, according to Rebbe, even if you don't do Teshuvah, the power of Yom Kippur can create a lot of atonement, can, can do a lot of cleansing. But as we said, unfortunately, that works. Now, you should know something. There are some sins that Teshuvah and Yom Kippur isn't enough to really clean it free, to really get genuine a dry cleaning technique going here, which we'll speak about what actually tragically needs to happen. That's what I think we've all had, especially over this year, challenges, what's called Yisurim, illnesses, pains, hardships, financial hardships, all these Yisurim actually cleanse us, which by the way, next time a challenge happens, and I just, before I, I forget, I really want to give a refor shalema to a dear friend of, of all of us, Louise, who, young woman who Hashem took away her sight, and now she, she, after having a dialysis, she fell over and has broken her hip. And she's really, she needs a refor shalema for liba bas nechoma. Hashem should give you a, a huge refor shalema. I said to her tonight, you're one of the holiest people I know in the world to, to have challenge after challenge after challenge. But essentially when we get challenges, it does cleanse us. It does cleanse us. It's not stum. It's not random. That's the first chapter. Then the second chapter says the Rambam. How do you do complete teshuva? How do you do complete shiva? It's very interesting what he says. And this is what you need to know. You're really going to get tested. Let's say, hopefully, we're going to speak soon about what you're going to work on something. And there's something you're going to work on. Hashem and the angels are going to say, let's see if Yeshua means business. Let's see if Katya is being honest. Straight after Yom Kippur, we're going to challenge them. We're going to put them back in that situation. Let's see how they do. Says the Rambam. Something called Teshuvah Gemura. Complete Teshuvah is only when you've been tempted and you're put exactly in that situation with the same inclination, the same temptation, the same opportunity. And then you say no in heaven. Pshhh. Then there's a big pshhh. Then you've really done what's called Teshuvah Gemura. Complete Teshuvah. Then you're really, you've done it on the highest level. That's an A star to shiva. By the way, we shouldn't ask for it. We shouldn't go looking for it. Let's say, you know, you say, I'm doing shiva for not eating, for eating non-kosher. And then after Yom Kippur, you go to sit at your non-kosher restaurant and you order the menu, right? And then I'm going to walk out. Don't do that. You're joking. It's the last thing you need to do. Please don't do that because you'll fail. Right? So we definitely don't do that. And he gives, a, he gives an example. He says, he says, let's say someone had an affair. Someone had an affair. He's only done real to shiva. Obviously, he has to do first step, step to shiva, which we'll speak about soon. But only real to shiva is after he's apologized and after he's ended it. Then Hashem will put him back in, in a situation where him and her could be in the same vicinity. Right? They're in the same place and they could get together. And then he says, no way, I'm done. Made that mistake. Been there, done that, got the T-shirt. Didn't end well, literally, or her t-shirt. And I'm never going to make that mistake again. And you ended it, only then, only then is it complete shiver. Okay. And by the way, it's not enough, let's say, to get very old and then you're not interested in that anymore. Right? And then, oh, no, no, no. Like, shkoyach, doesn't work that way. Yes, sure. So the guy has to apologize to the husband. We'll speak about it. Every, you've got to apologize to everybody. But it's, it's a bit complicated because sometimes if you're going to apologize to the husband, you might end up dead. Right. Do you know what I mean? Like if you're in, in a situation where violence and GBH is going to occur, maybe you shouldn't be um, apologizing. Do you know what it's like? Lashon Hara. Like, do you really want to go up to certain people and say, by the way, I really slandered you. And this is what I said. <laughs> right. It might not end well. So for me, I think we have to do some. The Chavetz Chaim says you can do this. Some more like generic ones where you send someone a nice Rosh Hashanah message or wishing you a happy new year. And if... I've upset you or done anything against you this year. I hope you can forgive me and I won't do it again. That's enough. That's good enough. In a scenario where it could get violent, right? Unless you're up for some violence. <laughs> now, this is the thing I really want to share with you. This is now the meat and drink. You're ready? How to do Teshuvah. Here we go. It's found, if you want to check it out later, in chapter 2, Halacha 2 of the Rambam. And he says the following, Ma, he, had shuva. How do we do Teshuvah? Number one. 
you've got to leave the sin. You've got to stop the sin. First of all, you've got to stop. You know, I, I laugh. It's like sometimes we want to go and it's like, say, say sorry. Let's go and say sorry. So can you imagine like a guy goes to his wife and says, really sorry, I, um, I've had an affair. But he hasn't ended it. You know, if he hasn't ended it, are you joking? Like, you've got to end it. We've got to, first of all, stop. We've got to stop the poison. We've got to stop the addiction in that scenario. You've got to just stop, first and foremost. You can't say sorry to Hashem for eating pork with pork in your mouth. <laughs> and, and, and then you're about to go and eat pork tomorrow. Like, Hashem's like, are you joking? Are you a bit, like, schizophrenic or something? Like, make your mind up. First and foremost, what do you want to do? Do you want to eat pork or not? Right? Are you a pork eater or not? If once you're not, then come back and talk. So the Ramam says very clearly, number one, you've got to stop. Now you've got to stop. And then he says something very hard, which pff, I think is very tough. But he's so much of us, so you need to actually remove it from your thoughts. So I want you all now to start, everybody, please start thinking, what are the Averas that you need to do Shiva for? So like, start making it really real. Start thinking, what are the sins? And I know you might be here all night, right? But start thinking, like, what are the cool ones you need to start, you really need to do to Shiva for? What's going to be on your mind? And then start thinking how you're going to do this process. The first thing is just to stop it. Second is to stop even fantasizing about it. You've got to remove it from your thoughts. If you're like, if it's just on your mind, you're just thinking about it. Let's say it's non-kosher food, but you're just like dreaming of it and thinking of the next time you're going to like devour some trafe, right? <laughs> then, then forget about it. that's. Drum mum's like, no, 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 we're not happy with that. That's not to show her, yes. How, how can you switch your mind? Good question. Like, we'll get if there. It, if it gets to you and sure. you can say no, you, you can divert your mind and, and focus your attention on something else. It's, it's there in, in the background waiting. Sure, I get it, I get it. So, so we're going to speak about it. It's, gonna, it's a whole process, which really the second part of my talk which is really inspirational talk, really how to change your mindset, because you're right. But this is what, the, I'm just giving you, first of all, the black and white of the Rambam. First one was to stop, then to remove it from your mind. Then next one is to regret. You've got to have regret. You've actually got to have real regret. You can't, you've got to be, so, if you're like, back to the case of the affair, he's like, whenever he thinks about it, he smiles. It's not good. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, like, do you know what I mean? If you're smiling with the thoughts of your Avera, that's not regretting. Do you know what I mean? You've got to actually be, feel sick. You should actually feel like repulsive about it. Like if there's an area you've done, ugh, you like, you feel so dirty and it's disgusting what I've done. Like now we're talking. If you're like, hmm, actually, do you know what I mean? Forget about it, right? That's, that's not what the Rambam wants. And then he says something which we're going to speak about soon, which I'm so blessed that I've learned a new insight into. The Rambam says, Vi yoid all of your dead talomos. You've got to reach the level where Hashem, who knows what's hidden, will be able to testify and say, this guy's genuine, mm. which is really scary. Because <laughs> now, now what does that mean? Does that mean that you can never do it again? And if you do it again, that means it wasn't to shiver? We'll discuss that because that sounds super scary. And then the Ramam says, so, and this is the highest thing. It's called Kabbalah La'asid. You've got to make resolutions that you're not going to do it again. Resolutions, not you're going to do it again. So, for example, you, as I said, you can't say, okay, Hashem, I'm really sorry, but it's in my diary for doing it in a week. You know, Hashem is like, uh, come back when you're like sorted. So, it's called Kabbalah La'asid, resolution for the future. And here's the thing. Every sin needs a different battle plan. So, the sin of Lashon Hara, you can't just say, Hashem, I never speak Lashon Hara again. Hashem's like, uh, ready? <laughs> Give it about five minutes. <laughs> uh, by the way, it's crazy. Like, I see people in Shulam Yom Kippur, they're saying, I'm sorry for speaking Lashon Hara. And then when I'm like walking outside Shulam, I'm hearing people say, oh, the rabbi was so boring this year. You know, and the chazan, he's got such a horrible voice, gave me a headache. Like, mm -hmm. people are speaking Lashon Hara about the rabbi in Shul on Yom Kippur. Not good. And then a few minutes earlier, they were saying, sorry, we're speaking Lashon Hara. So you've got to be kind of real where we are. And, and, and that, in other words, that wasn't called vidoy, what they did. What you need to do is say, I'll never do it again. And we're going to speak about it a bit later. Is that even realistic? Can we genuinely say to Hashem, I'll never do it again? 
like, and Hashem knows what's going in our thoughts. We're going to speak about that shortly. And I've got something super inspiring. So don't go anywhere, because that's the best part. So don't go anywhere. Finally, once you've made the resolution, then you do the confession. So once you've done that, so you've stopped, you've regretted, you've resolved to change, then you can say to Hashem, Hashem, I did X, Y, Z, and I'm no longer that person. By the way, the Ramam says an amazing thing. The Ramam says some, sometimes to do real tshuva, people should change their name, change what they look like, go to a different place, like start afresh, like start afresh, like as a new person, a new Facebook profile. You know, the Ramam doesn't say that, like a new Instagram site, right? You know, from a, right? You've got to like, it's, it's, it, that's obviously quite intense. And by the way, someone who's a real Balta Shiva, someone who's really turned their life around from living a very, very secular life to now a fully observant life, you're not allowed to actually remind them of their past. It's actually a sin to remind them of their past because they're, they're, they're like, they're, they're, they've shifted. Now, some people don't mind talking about the past. They're, like, they're cool with it, right? But for those people who are like, it, it was a bit of a trauma and now they are in a different place, you can't just like talk about what happened 30 years ago. What if they they're, want to share? What if they're no, that's, that's fine, that's fine, that's fine, that's fine, that's fine, that's fine. That's beautiful. But um, you're not allowed to, to do that, to remind them if they don't want to be reminded. Because they're a new person now. They're like someone brand new. You're someone brand new. You know, it's funny. My mom, the way she said it to me, she had it in a ship. Her Robertson said, let's call it RSVP. <laughs> so sugar can be RSVP. What does that mean? Because I liked it, so, but I, I just thought, I, I mean, being like a lambda Sharab, I wasn't happy because the order was wrong. But for, I'll, I'll let you have it because it could be a nice way to remember it. R is to regret. First of all, regret the Avera, right? S, to stop the Avera. V, to verbalize the confession. And P, to plan for the future, never to do it again. Now, the truth is, I was trying, trying to explain to my mom, she wasn't really having it, that it's the wrong order. You know, really, it's got to be now, let's see if we can do the right order, everyone. What's the right order? What's the first one? Stop. S, and then R. Let's see if this is right. S, and then R, and then R again. Resolve, and then V. S-R-R-V. What does that stand for? Sounds like a place yeah, in, in the Soviet yeah. Union somewhere, right? Yeah. So, um... Right? So SRRV, is big. that's why they, Herebison said RSVP, it makes much more sense to be fair. But it's just not the right order, but it's all good. If you do RSVP, it's fine as well, right? But that's, you've got to do those four. In other words, now we know what sugar is, RSVP. You've got to go through the regret. You've got to stop it. You've got to verbalize to Hashem and you've got to plan how you're never going to do it again. Okay, RSVP. You've got to RSVP Hashem this year. One last thing before I go into it a little bit deeper. And numbers, if you go to chapter two, Halacha seven, it's such a beautiful Rambam. I'm just going to share this with you. It's really inspiring. The Rambam says in chapter two, seven, he says something gorgeous. He says that, I'll find it, a three, seven, I don't know. Basically that, that um, when you really do Shuva, you can get to a place where Shuva Yisrael Ad Hashem Elokecha. There's a verse in the, in the Torah which says you're meant to return until Hashem. Which means the goal of Shuva now is to get so united with Hashem, which we're going to speak about now. Because there's a famous question, my friends, and, and I will be um, very impressed. There's a black belt question for you to do a bit of research in. Why does the Rambam not mention it as one of the 613 mitzvahs in the Torah? He doesn't mention Teshuvah. For the Rambam, in his, he has a book where he calculates what are the 630 mitzvot are. He mentions confession, but doesn't mention Teshuvah. But yet the Smak and the Sefer Chinuch and the Ramban, the other ones mention Teshuvah also as a unique mitzvah. So it's a famous question. It's written a whole book about Teshuvah, but he doesn't say it's one of the 630 mitzvot. And the question I'd like to pose is why. It's a very famous question, very tricky question. I'd like to share with you an answer tonight, a, a mystical answer, which is, I think, very beautiful. But aren't the 613 mitzvot for the Shuvah? But, but it should, you, we talk a lot about Shuvah. There's many verses in the Torah which says you should do Shuvah, you should repent, you should return. But yet, he doesn't count it as one of the 600. You know, Nachmanides does count it very much. And the other 
sages who count the mitzvahs do count it, but the Rambam, controversially, uniquely, doesn't count. I'd like to share with you maybe a story of why not. And the story I heard, it goes like this. There, we're speaking a lot about Hasidus tonight. The third Lubavitcher Rebbe was the Tzemach Tzedek. The Tzemach Tzedek was actually, after a few years, he was an orphan. He was an orphan. And he was brought up by the great Balatanya. By the, by the Balatanya, the, the sage, the first Lubavitcher Rebbe wrote. That was his Zayda. That was his grandfather. So the story goes that the Tzemach Tzedek, when he was a young boy, he was sitting on, on his Zayda's knee learning. And the Semach said his little boy starts playing with the, the Zayda's beard, saying, Zayda, Zayda. And Balatanya Zayda, that's not Zayda. That's Zayda's beard. So the Semach said it, took his shirt, Zayda, Zayda. So the Balatanya is like, no, no, that's not Zayda. That's Zayda's shirt. It's a poor boy, right? <laughs> so then he's like, he's knocking on his head. He's like, in his head. That's not Zayda. That's Zayda's head. So now he's really confused. And the Semach said it goes off his knee, goes to the corner of the room, starts thinking, closes his eyes, says, Zayda, where are you? And the Balatanya says, this is Zayda. I'm here. Can you imagine how these great Sadiqim, when they were talking to their children, were telling them very deep messages? What was the deep message? That you are, you're not your body. You're not your body. There's a big Sadiq. Maybe I'll speak about another class. I've got an amazing story about him called the Sefer Haredim, who wrote the great um, book, he wrote the story, he did Nefesh, wrote the pray, he did Nefesh. Sefer Haredim writes a book where he explains how each of the 613 mitzvahs connect to all different parts of our body. So what about Teshuvah? Because Teshuvah is more than your body. Teshuvah is your relationship with Hashem. Teshuvah is who you are. Teshuvah means, do you want to return to Hashem or not? The Talmud says everybody sins. So it says in the Matrix, everybody falls. Everybody falls near. Right? They're, they're, but Mishle says that Tzaddik falls seven times but gets up. We all sin. The Talmud says maybe four people didn't sin. Binyamin, Tovid Amenech's father. Chana, you can always forget the third. Everyone else sins. We all sin. Everyone who's listening tonight has sinned at least today many times. Sorry. Unless you just woke up. And then even then you probably sinned because you missed all the mitzvahs today. <laughs> so we all sin. But the question is, what do we do when we sin? After we sin, do we say, oh, can't wait to sin again? Or... Do we say, ay, 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 Hashem, I'm sorry. I need to do better next time. Forgive me. I want to get closer to you. I know that's not why I am in this world. Ach, my Yitzhahara got me. Got me again. Okay, I've got to fight harder next time. We, the world, my friends, is, is in two camps. It's in the camp of when we sin. Can't wait for the next one. Or... Hashem, help me not sin again. That's who you are. You're not your mitzvahs. You're not your body. You are if you, how you relate to Hashem. Explains the Meshechochma, the Lubavitch Chirever explains, you know why the Ramam doesn't say Chuvah is a mitzvah? Because it's more than a mitzvah. It's a meta mitzvah. It's an overarching mitzvah. It defines, are you a mitzvah person or not? Because it basically means when you sin, are you going to stop sinning and say, I now need to improve? Or oh, God forbid, just the sin go on, and another one, and another one. And then some people are even proud of their sins, like notches on their belts. And then that's who they are at that time. And then they need to just shiver from that. So that's one beautiful, famous answer that we are more, that we are more than a mitzvah because sugar is who you are. That's Emma's who you are. But let's go a little bit deeper because I was thinking about it. When we talk about forgiveness, we talk about atoning our sin, what's actually being damaged? We're taught, so let's, let's say, imagine you have a beautiful white, beautiful Shabbos tablecloth. You spent a lot of money on it and it's your first Friday night, you put it out. And within five minutes, some lobbers have spilled wine all over it. Anyone ever had that? It happened to me many times, oh, right? <laughs> right? So, so now there's wine over it. So this lovely, beautiful, pristine white is no longer pristine white. It's white and red and purple. And... So now you've got to get the stain out. 
So it seems that when you're doing tshuva, you're getting the stain out. But I started thinking, where are you getting the stain out of? Because your neshama is pure. Hashem is part of Hashem. We say every morning, thank you Hashem for restoring the neshama to Hira. It's a pure, beautiful soul inside me. So you're not damaging the Hashem. You're not damaging your soul per se. So what are you damaging? So I'd like to give you a little demonstration of what you're damaging. Are you ready for this? A Kabbalistic, Kabbalistic demonstration. Here we go. Something I prepared earlier. Okay. And you'll learn something about this tonight. Here we go. So what is this? Shabbos lamp. This is a beautiful Shabbos lamp. Anybody wants a Shabbos lamp, meaning you want to have light in your room, but then you want to have darkness a few moments later without breaking Shabbat. So you go like this and conceal it. So why is that? Because the light, let's say this is the neshama. We are all neshamas. We all illuminate Hashem's light to the world. You can't touch the light. The light's infinite. Your sin doesn't influence the light, doesn't impact the light. It covers over the light. Someone has non-kosher food, starts going like that. More non-kosher food, starts being egotistical, starts being arrogant, starts speaking Lashonara. Before you know it, the light's covered. Meaning your power in this world is darkened. Your power in this world is limited. You're no longer able to illuminate that which, you've, which you could illuminate. That's what we're being mechapet. That's what you're uncovering. That's what we're cleansing. You're not fixing your soul. You're fixing a lot of the schmutz and the dirt which is surrounding our beautiful soul. And you're allowing your genuine, true self to then illuminate into the world. I thought that was a, a beautiful way of putting it. And now we know what returning means. Because teshuva means when you were born, you have this perfect, beautiful, infinite neshama without any dirt. <laughs> right? The light is just able to shine. That's why sometimes you see a child that's so innocent. There's, there's, you, there's actually you know, a lot of godliness in their eyes. They're innocent. They're not tainted by the evils of the Yitzhahara. They're just this beautiful innocence. Nowadays, one of the sadnesses of we're living in a society where even young girls can be walking around, young boys, and, and all of a sudden they look like the 21, the 12 and 13, and they're dressing that way. People are losing their innocence so quickly, tragically. So to shiva means you're returning back to your innocence. You're returning back to your essence, you're returning back to how you bought the beautiful white tablecloth in the shop, which wasn't stained. There was no stain over it. We have, it was pre-stain. So you, every time we can go back to that, you're going back to your former glory. And that's what teshuva is. I think also means the word answer, because if teshuva is the answer, what's the question? Meaning the question of life, of how do we get close to Hashem? How do we achieve success in life? When Hashem's given us a Yitzhahara, when Hashem's given us Olam Azeh, the, uh, the answer is Teshuvah. Teshuvah is the answer. Someone says to me, Rabbi, how do I get more muzzle in my life? Teshuvah. How do I get more divine providence in my life? Teshuvah. Teshuvah is always the answer. Teshuvah is the answer. It's not easy. It's not easy to fix, right? It's not easy to say, okay, I'm really going to turn my life around because the Yitzhahara is employed 24-7 to stop you doing that. And he's way cleverer than you. Does the Yetzir decline on Shabbos in any way at all? No. <laughs> right? Actually, it's not true. And um, you have a Neshama Yisera. Yeah. You have a higher soul, so people are lifted up. But the Yetzir is still there, obviously. Yeah. And, and, and but you have greater weapons at your disposal on Shabbos with Kiddush. But, but then, God forbid, if one doesn't use the instruments at our disposal, it's like Elul, the kings in the field. But then if we really act, misbehave, then it probably does more damage. It's like if you, one of the worst sins we can do, sorry to say, is by desecrating Shabbat in public. It's bad because it's Shabbat is a time for us to be really tuned in. And then if we're like, mis, we're abusing that, it's, it's a problem. Obviously someone who isn't brought up in that lifestyle and it's very new. So obviously one, take one step at a time, but understand from a macro perspective, to do things publicly is, is, a, is a big problem. So I want to finish off by sharing something very deep with you, which has changed my life from this morning, because it's a problem I've had for many, many years. And I'm really hoping that you will like this and love the concepts and love the story. Story is a very beautiful story. 
got me emotional, so hopefully I can hold it together to now. So I'd like to conclude like this, then obviously happy to take questions from online and on the table, if that makes sense. <laughs> so here we go. The question is the following. How is it genuinely possible to do teshuva if in order to do teshuva you need to resolve never to do it again to the extent that Hashem knows your thoughts and Hashem knows what's going to happen in the future? Let's say you're, you're going to say, Hashem, give me teshuva for Yom Kippur, I'm sorry. You go to the process and you go and say sorry to the person that you spoke Lashon Hara about. And, you, and by the way, Kabbalah La'asid means you need resolutions, you need strategies. So for example... The strategy not to speak Lashon Hara is going to be to buy the book, Guard, Guard Your Tongue. You need to learn what is Lashon Hara. You're not going to say, I'm never going to speak Lashon Hara again. That's it. Forget about it. You need, first of all, information, education. Then you need a strategy when you're with your friends where you speak Lashon Hara. What are you going to do next time Lashon Hara comes up? You need a strategy. Do you change the topic? Do you maybe have to go to different locations? Maybe you have to be with different friends. You have to have a strategy. And by the way, you need that strategy for every single mitzvah. Let's say someone wants to strategize by not losing their temper, right? They can't just say, I'm not gonna lose my temper again. They've got to stop and think, oh, why am I losing my temper? <clears throat> What's the cause of it? They should probably buy again information. So they get a book about temper man anger, anger management, I believe the best one spiritually is the Ramban's one where he writes it to his child called Igeres HaRamban, which is all about how not to lose your temper. Letter of the Ramban. You can have a nice English, there's a nice English copy of that as well. You've got to have humility because humility is the root. So you've got to go through the strategy for each and every, you can't just say, I'm not going to do it again. You've actually got to strategize, but then you've got to make a resolution and you've got to think in three months time, as I said, you can't say sorry for having non-kosher if you're going to be next week at a non-kosher restaurant. You've got to take it out of your diary. And then it says Hashem can see the future. So if Hashem can see the future, here's my problem. A lot of people get very disillusioned and they say, well, it's too hard. And then when they do sin after Yom Kippur, they feel, oh, what's the point? And then the Yitzhara gets them. Because then the Yitzhara is, you're mine now. You're all mine. We're going to have a real party, right? And then, and then it takes you on a crazy binge of sins for six months. And then you wake up on Pesach for a few weeks. And then you're back <laughs> sinning again until you come back to Yom Kippur. And then, whoa, I won't do it again. And then five minutes after Yom Kippur, you've done it again. And then, oh, what's the point? Right? It's like, if, if you're looking at Teshuva, it's like, you're coming off drugs, and then the first time you get back to drugs, then you think, oh, what's the point? Everyone's going to give up. I, for many years, was bothered by this because my whole journey in spirituality has been to try and become much more inspired about spirituality as opposed to being fearful. I think a lot of people, when they hear about Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, they're scared. They're fearful. Here's my problem with people who are fearful and scared. That's not a healthy relationship. That's kind of an abusive relationship. Like if you've got a relationship with your parents, when you hear them coming down the stairs, you start trembling. Mm, what have they done to you? Why is that going on? That's not love. That's not respect. Too many people around Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, they have fear. And then they say, oh, this is too heavy, too intense. I'm out and the Yitzhahara has a party. So my whole journey into spirituality by, by, thank God, finding Hasidus has been, it's about joy. It's about happiness. It's about love. So how does that fit with Rosh Hashanah? Because the king wants a relationship with you and loves you. So then how does that work to, he can see the future and he's got to, he's going to know what's really going in your heart. So let me share with you some very deep ideas. Number one, Rabbi Nachman. Beautiful Rabbi Nachman, Likitimai Run. Number 272. He says, the first and foremost, when you do real teshuva, it's actually not about saying to Hashem, in six months time, I won't do it again. In nine months time, I won't do it again. It's about saying, today, I pledge not to do it again. Rabbi Nachman says, we have to learn during this pandemic, it's really taught us that, to live in the now, to live in the day, that every day, just make the best of it. Because tomorrow, in a sense, tomorrow never comes. Let me explain, Kabbalistically, what is tomorrow? Tomorrow is just another today. 
Meaning, Kabbalistically, we learn that Hashem creates the world every moment. Hamachadesh, Betzuboi, Bechol Yoyim Tomit. There's a renewal of creation, renewal of creation, renewal of creation. So everything's another Hayoyim. So tomorrow is going to be a whole new universe, says, the, says Rabbi Nachman. It's a whole new experience. So many, so much changes between one day and the other. Says Rabbi Nachman, just focus on the day. But on that day, be genuine. It doesn't say in the Rambam, Hashem can see the future. It says Hashem can see what's in your heart. Hashem can see what's hidden. Meaning, are you standing before him lying your head off? Saying, oh, I'm not going to do it again. Like, that's not obviously cool. Hashem isn't like a judge at court that can't see what's going on in your heart. Hashem can see what's in your heart. But all you can do is the best. All you can do is your best. So you're saying, Hashem, I'm fiercely determined to try my best not to do it again. Beautiful. That's it. Then even if five minutes after Yom Kippur you've messed up, it's a new sin. But it hasn't retroactively spoiled the teshuva. Because at least for a few moments, you showed who you really were. Where you genuinely wanted to get super connected to Hashem. And you want to be the best you can be. And you want to be your higher self. And that's the real you. In heaven, they're clapping. They're clapping. Amazing. And then when the Yitzhahara gets you five minutes later, okay, it's a new sin. It's a beautiful idea from Rabbi Nachman, no? And the Chazanish says the same thing. The Chazanish quotes Avram Avinu. What Avram Avinu said, Avram Avinu said that when the whole world went against him and he was trying to deal with polytheism, Avram Avinu said, Ani Choyma, I'm a wall. He became a wall. He became so stubborn and resolute and fiercely determined in his ethical monotheism that come what may, he was going to succeed. Says the Chazanish, we all have the power to say, Ani Choyma, I'm a wall. This is it. This is the new me. I'm fiercely determined to achieve that. And then even if the Yitzhar in two months time wears you down, Peseda, you start again. Okay, everyone sins. Start, not that we're condoning it, but you start again. You don't just give up. You don't just say, what was the point? Because I think it's a very beautiful idea. You have to learn to live in the now. You learn to live in the now. And just to finish off with, <clears throat> just to finish off with this beautiful story, beautiful story. You said a lot about the Tzemach Sedex when he was a little boy on his grandfather's knee. Let's say a story about when he got up. When he was older and he was the rabbi of the town, there was a terrible fire in Russia, a terrible fire where he was. And a few years later, they'd now fixed up the town and fixed up the beautiful shawl. And they were going to go back in the shawl for the first time. And Semach said that standing there. And he said, the whole town is about to go and party and sing and dance into the shawl. And he was going to speak to them first. So his like very holy Hasidim were there waiting for what's called a mimer, a very detailed, deep Torah thought. But the whole town was there. And he thought he needed to say something for everyone. So he goes, I've got, I can either give you a mimer or a story. What do you want, a mime or a story? And his big chassidim and a mime and everyone else like story, please. He goes, I'll give you a story. And he told them all a the story. And here's the story that I'm going to share with you now. As the Semach said, there was a man who unfortunately lived a very immoral, unethical, arrogant, lobbysticker lifestyle. Going from one sin to another, one crime to another. One act of disloyalty to another, ruined his marriage, ruined his business. Tremendous amount of sins. He died and he goes to the next world. So this is something I said, let me tell you what happened. He goes into the next world and he has a big court case. And in the court case, the three angels are sitting by the base in. And they're showing him a video screen of all his sins. And they get to the end of the court case and say, you're guilty. And the said, the man gets up and says, whoa, one minute, one minute, one minute. Nah, I'm not accepting this verdict. And the heavenly court, okay, we don't normally have this. What's going on? He goes, no, 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 no. Hello, you three of you are angels. Shkayach, you're angels. Of course you are holy. 
I'd be holy as well if I was an angel. You haven't even got a Yed Sahara. You don't know what it's like to be me. You don't know what happened to my childhood. You don't know the traumas that I had, the pain that I had. You don't know what it's like to be me. I'm not being judged by them. Bring me some humans. They never had that before. And the heavenly courts are like, oh, he's got a point. What do we do? Okay, let's bring him some humans. So he brought some humans. Moshe Rabbeinu, the Rambam, and Avram Avinu were sitting there on the base there. And the man's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Forget about it. Are you joking? Hashem, if Hashem would have made Moshe Rabbeinu, I would have been like Moshe Rabbeinu. I need people like me to judge me. And then we can have a fair trial. And they thought, see, it's got a good point. And then Semach said it, said to everybody, you can judge him. Guilty or innocent. Guilty or innocent. And the whole town yelled out, innocent! And crying, they all went to dance in the show. This is so deep. Because the Semach Sedek saying a big secret. A lot of people don't do Teshuva and don't go into Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur because they have such low self-esteem. They feel Hashem will view them as guilty. They feel, what's the point? Like, the Yitzhar is so strong. Like, I, what I get up to, I really shouldn't even be going to Shul. Says the Semach Sedek, we're human. Hashem's created us with the Yitzhahara. It's meant to be tough. We're meant to have all sorts of desires which will be contrary to the Torah. But it's not about that. It's about what you do with them. It's about are you able to try your best? Are you able to illuminate that natural light that Hashem blessed you with? Not everyone's meant to be a Mo No one's meant to be a Moshe Rabbeinu apart from Moshe Rabbeinu. And it's just got to be L's. That's it. Simon's got to be Simon. You're sure has got to be Simon. You're sure, and that's it. We've got to be ourselves, but ourselves at a higher level. And if we view ourselves as beautiful, if we view ourselves as mamleches koyanim, princes and princesses, which we are, the Torah says we're that. If we view ourselves on that level genuinely, that gives us the inspiration. That gives us the inspiration to say, wow. Hashem loves me. And if you can go into your focus on Teshuvah, saying Hashem loves me, it's going to be okay. Let's now maximize my greatest part of me. Let me help achieve the best of myself because I believe in myself. And Hashem does believe in me. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been alive today. Every day when we wake up, we say, Thank you, Hashem. Because you, Hashem, have faith in me. You had faith in me to allow me to live today. That means Hashem has faith in us. If we have faith in ourselves, that will give us the inspiration to try and combat the Eight Sahara to say, okay, um, what can I do to make the best of it? And something I'll be saying, especially next week, to start thinking about it now, start thinking about at least one or two things that you say, let's tr at least try to make an effort in this year so that in a year's time, my young people won't be the same as this year, which is the same as last year, the same 10 years. We can do better than that. We should learn the lesson of the story we had at the beginning where the old man went to the rabbi, said to him, I'll give you a dollar bill on your bris milah, but it took him 50 years. Hashem's in the field now, the king's in the field. You're hearing what you need to hear tonight. And if you go and learn tomorrow, you'll hear what you need to hear tomorrow. Hashem's with you. Not, no such thing as randomness. You'll get to where you need to get to. But all we need to do is make that free will decision. Do we try and return or do we say we continue? May Hashem help us all return. May Hashem help us all do tshuva. May we all be blessed with a kasiva of a kasima toiva, with the goods and blessed and beautiful year ahead where there's no more magefa, where please God, the nega, the plague, turns to oineg, turns to joy. And please God, 5782 will be the, the year of the greatest happiness, which is the, the gula shalema, where it will be the year when please God, Mashiach will come and redeem us all. Thank you.